a croeso cynnes rhy gyd i'r rhaglen yma o FCTV lle byddwn yn canolbwyntio ar ffrwyth Londeb. Mae ffrwyth Londeb diadell neu feiches yn effeithio yn unigyrchiol ar perfformiad busnes ac yn yr eu temau nesaf byddwn yn edrych ar y ffactorau sydd yn gallu cael effaith ar hyn. Byddwn yn ymweld â fferm laeth nant glas sy wedi bod yn gweithio i leihau cyfnod lloia yn eu feiches. Yn ymuno â Non William sydd ar fferm mwy logan fawr sydd yn canolbwyntio ar y defnydd o technoleg i wella cyfraddau beichiogi a thynhau y patrwm lloia yn eu beiches signo. Ond yn gyntaf, byddwn yn clywed gan Leslie Stubbings am y ffactorau sy'n effeithio ar cyfraddau sganio diadelloedd. Hello, I'm Leslie Stubbings and I'm an independent sheep consultant and I want to talk to you about the importance of getting ready for tupping and tupping management because the bottom line is that profitability of the flock is going to very much depend on how well that goes and therefore how many lambs are reared at the end of the year. One of the most important factors is the body condition of the ewe and we know that that body condition is going to have an effect on how well she performs not just actually at tupping but all the way through to how many lambs she rears and how well those lambs do. So focusing in on body condition and trying to get as many of the flock absolutely in the target range when the tups go in is really really important and that's going to have massive effect all throughout the year. The target body condition score for ewes at this time of year is going to vary according to the system and the type of ewe, but generally speaking for a lowland type ewe, a half bred, um, then you're going to be looking at body condition score three, three and a half. And for a hill ewe, you're going to be looking at more like two and a half to three possibly, depending on the system. What you've got to bear in mind, particularly for hill ewes, is that if you push them too hard, they are very capable of having twins. And so you've really got to try and manage that a little bit if you know the resources that you've got are going to make it difficult to manage twins at the other end. So body condition on a hill flock can actually be a really useful positive management tool. So in, at the moment, you know, where you're at the point where you're nearly ready to put the rams out, obviously the body condition of the ewes is where it is and we would hope that the work has been done to try and get as many there, but inevitably some ewes are going to be a bit leaner. Um, now those ewes need the better going, of course. What you've got to remember is that a lean ewe will eat more as well. So the dry matter you put in front of those has to be more because a lean ewe is going to eat more so she can actually push herself up. But equally, I think where we are at the moment, uh, generally in agriculture, with costs and everything going up, this is the year not to put use to the top where you've really got doubts that they're going to be a problem. You know, they might be lean, they might be still be lame, you haven't quite got them right. I would say think long and hard, have an extra little riddle through before you put the rams in and, and just don't put anything doubtful to the top. The chances are it'll cost you a lot of money and it's the one that's going to let you down. As far as tups are concerned, again, body condition score is really important. And, and of course, the thing about tups is that we have to remember that actually that work needs to start at least eight weeks before they go out to work, because that's when the semen's developing and that's when you want to make sure that things are tip top. But at the point of tupping, there's still worth just having a think about, are they in the right condition? Have we still got any lameness that we need to check on? Um, some people, you know, they're afraid of using antibiotic, for instance, just close to tupping because they think it's going to affect fertility. Actually, it's not the antibiotic that's going to affect the fertility. It's the fact that they might not be quite so sound. So, you know, don't be frightened to have a word with the vet if there's something that you feel you could still do. Um, and just have an extra check over those rams again. You know, hopefully you've MOT'd them before, but it's worth just having another check before you turn them out, just to make sure they haven't got any injuries, that there's nothing that's actually going to stop them working properly, that, you know, the testicle size is right and, and, and they feel right, that they're in tip-top condition. Um, and the other little trick is when you've got them turned up, particularly if it's young rams that you're using, then it's good to tip them up. And if you just look in the axillae under the, in, inside the front legs and inside the back legs, they should be really purple and waxy. And that's a really good sign that you know, the testosterone levels are high and that they're ready for work. 
If you want to have a more compact lambing, and obviously these days, you know, we've all got other things to do, you want to get it over with, a lot of people haven't got the luxury of being able to let it go on for weeks and weeks, uh, then using teasers is something to look at. Now, what teasers will do is they will bring into season ewes that aren't already cycling. So depending on how early in the season you are, the more effect they will have. Um, if you're getting further on, then most ewes will be cycling, but it's the younger ewes perhaps that the teasers will bring on to cycle for the first time. Um, the main thing, to, two things to remember about teasers is number one, don't leave them in too long. Um, 17 days is the absolute maximum because if they do their job then you want the, the, the fertile rams in before if the next cycle. Um, so that's number one. Number two is that they really only work if the ewes have been starved of any contact with rams for several weeks beforehand. So if you're going to do that, just make sure the group you want to tease are not in any sight, sound or smell of any rams, because then they, you won't get that nice sort of surprise element when the teasers go in. So they're the two important things. And I think a third point, just to add another one, is if you have teased, just look at your U to ram ratios because you've pulled everything together you really do have to shorten those ratios to make sure that everything gets covered in the time available and you don't end up with teased ewes and then a massive great big long protracted lambing. I think this year rattles are going to be probably more valuable than they've ever been. I mean, I, I like to use rattles, but I mean, obviously it depends on what your management system is. Um, but at least with rattles, yeah, you know how it's going and you can also organise use into groups. And I think this year with feed prices as they are, knowing even if you just know what your second half of lambing is by putting a rattle on halfway through, you're going to avoid overfeeding those animals. And, you know, we all know it's going to be expensive. So just from a, a management point of view, really worth thinking about, even if you only, as I say, put it on halfway. Um, any that are in the first unmarked group, if you're scanning, you're going to get the empties out of there anyway. So, um, but ideally change your colour as often as you can. Given that the fertility of the ewe is so important to us, and this is the start, you know, I, I would really urge people to think about using the abortion vaccines that we've got available. Um, so toxoplasma, no one can really protect their flock, a close flock or not. You, know, you only need one young cat to come in and you've got toxoplasmosis and it's going to cause problems and enzootic abortion similarly. But what you've got to remember with those vaccines is that you've got to give them at least four weeks before tupping. So you know, if you haven't already done them, don't be tempted to zip in there and try and do them at the last minute because that will affect fertility. You know, you get a reaction to any vaccine and it will drop the fertility off a little bit. So maybe if you haven't done it, think about it for next year. Croeso i Nant Glas. Gwenna'n Evans ydw i, Swyddog Technegol Llaith ar gyfer Cyswllt Ffermio. Heddi, ni gyda Iwan Francis sydd yn ffermio yma Nant Glas a'r milfeddig Kate Burnby, le fyddwn ni'n trafod y prosiect sydd y bod yn ymlaen yma dros y tair mlaed diwethaf yn edrych ar ffrwythondeb gwartheg. Yn tynhau i blocio lloia o dros 10 wythnos i o leia tan o 10 wythnos. Yes, yeah, so we farm in total about uh, 350 acres then and milk about 220 cows. Um, yeah, so they're New Zealand Freedom Cross jerseys. Um, yeah, typical yield from six to six and a half thousand um, and about 500 kilos of solids then. Um, yeah, the system then, so I, I carve uh, spring and autumn and uh, yeah, it's nearly 50-50 split then. Yeah. So about 110 in, in each block. As it's a relatively young business then, you know, we were looking to build numbers. You know, so at the beginning we were keeping stock as needed to build numbers and it, it did, yeah, we needed that 12 week calving block just to, yeah, hit the numbers then. But we've got to a stage now where we can, yeah, consolidate a bit and we've got enough young stock coming through. Um, no, so that just the main aim to look at fertility was improve like uh, aspects, all the aspects of it just a bit. I think yeah. there wasn't like one thing that we needed to improve. Um, not all areas needed to be improved a bit then, um, just to get performance wise and uh, labour saving. I, I, I came along to the farm for the first time in, in the autumn of 2019. One of the most striking things is really that the performance was pretty good to start with. So um, this herd by no means was a herd with poor fertility that we've improved. It was a herd with good fertility that's become even better.
uh, the first thing we measured was uh, analysing the carving pattern. Um, because we didn't have scanning data for uh, in-calf rates, we could only work on carved rates in the first season. Um, and really it was um, quizzing you in about like what had happened in November um, with your calving and how many metabolic cows, for example. Just, yeah, basically milk fever then, isn't it? Yeah. Especially in the autumn, in the autumn herd, because um, I was trying to carve, uh, yeah, all the cows on heifers outside. Um, yeah, carving on grass was, yeah, I was experiencing so like... Yeah, so we didn't have an exact figure of how many cows were treated, but you probably had at least one down cow that you could remember every calving session. Yeah, at least, I and think, you were looking at 20% of... Of cows animals. got a bottle or needed some yeah, treatment. Yeah, yeah, they needed treatment for milk really, and so cases were already running out 20, 25%, isn't it? Yeah. Um, which is not ideal. So I guess one of the biggest, like, pretty simple management changes that we made was calculating how much magnesium that um, you know, was supplementing, which you were supplementing already, weren't you? But it was... Yeah, it probably wasn't enough to the crack rate, really. Yeah, so we calculated the volume of the water troughs, worked out the number of cows, and put in mag chloride at a, at a higher rate and every day. So the cows need to be at least three weeks calved before we metric check them. Um, and you know, does them in, typically in batches according to their calving dates, but each cow it, basically 100% of the cows get a, a metric check. Um, and then you're not finding very many cows that require treatment. No, no, no not many. Which no, not many, indicates no. that they're calving in a nice clean environment and they're calving easily. Yeah. But, you know, we do pick up a, a small percentage. Yeah, a few, yeah, yeah. And that like has had an improvement as well. I think still, I think it's less than, it's less than 10%. Yes. Like I treated after after being metric checked, isn't it? Yeah. Um, no, that's one thing previously I didn't do then, you know, and that, yeah, that's had a positive effect yeah. on, on results. You, you might have found them later as non-cyclers or they might have been empty cows yeah. at the end. You yeah. Know, there's, well, I suppose the other big management change was then um, with heat detection was automated heat detection, wasn't it? Being yeah. able to put that in place. Yeah, since... Spring of 2020, was it? Yeah, I think we hired them. Hired them for two blocks, anyway. Yeah. Uh, then I yeah I purchased and then for half the herd, so I swapped the collars over. Um, yeah, when PDing to the other block, then as it's ne as it's needed. Um, I think yeah, they, yeah they've they worked very very well. Yeah. As I said at the beginning, I was tail painting everything and the labour was quite yeah. heavy handed on myself then. But and when I started talking about pre mating heat detection, it just felt like it was a big ask. But with the collars on, it's a lot easier, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. pre-mating, yeah, heat detection, yeah. So I had to, yeah, if, if I was doing that correctly, I'd have been tail for an extra four weeks, isn't it, before the yeah. start of mating. So you had a bit of fatigue kicking in before you actually started, yeah, Well, those, a lot of folk find they manage by, I mean, if you're not got automated heat detection, I have got, I, I recommend most of my clients use pre-mating heat, heat detection and, and a lot of them like tail paint and just check the cows twice a week and record the numbers of those that are yeah. rubbed so that you, it's not as good not as, an intense, as daily intense, but, yeah. but it, you know, it, it helps. Um, and then you were using some interventions on non-cyclers previously, but you were waiting until a month into mating. Well, three weeks, yeah, yeah until the first, first cycle, three weeks, yeah. Um, which again is quite typical, but um, I, I encouraged you to um, do pre-mating heat detection and then examine the non-cyclers a week before the start of mating. Yeah. And again, as things have gone on over the last three or four seasons, you're getting fewer and fewer non-cyclers because yeah. cows have had more time, etc. But but you're still getting a, a small number and yeah, yeah, and then, a small number, yeah. And then they have a chance to get a usually a. Um, well, they get so. An extra yeah. service probably, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. If they're doing yeah. that three weeks, three, uh, three weeks earlier. Yeah. Um, and the recommendation is with non-cyclers, so long as they're clean, um, we tend to use a program breeding um, with a progesterone adv um, device and estimates so they get served on day one or two of mating. Yeah. Yeah. So I was quite keen to in um, implement a front end loading with heifers to give the heifers additional time to recover before mating so that they then don't slip that nine or ten days that a first lactation animal 
um, on average does. And again, you get 90% of your heifers now calving in the first um, sort of three weeks, don't yeah. you? And, yeah. and, and, uh, and yeah, so we, hardly, we hardly lose a heifer now to uh, empty at the first. No, 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 no. So that's definitely helped, you know, with the, yeah, with the overall performance and, and, tight, you know, and tightening of the block then, isn't it? Yeah, yeah as one person maybe calving and, yeah, and, and calf fearing those number of calves, um, I might my max now then. I don't think I'd want it to get any more, any tighter than that. Um, but the heifers, I think we're probably starting to see a benefit with your heifer calves, aren't they? They're early born heifer replacements that are well grown, that then we're able to, Yeah. they're getting a synchrony program. They're calving a week before the herd. It all seems to be like functioning quite well, doesn't it? With those? Yeah. yeah. But yeah, as you said, like, with that 100 calving in the first 40 to 50 days, I noticed I got more, slightly more time between calving and meeting then. You can concentrate on calving, then that's nearly done, then you can concentrate on meeting again. As maybe previously, I'd, they'd overlap a bit too much and it wasn't like a defined finish. And a lot, you know, as you said, all those replacement heifer calves that I keep maybe in the first two weeks, a lot of them nearly weaned as well by mating. So, yeah, you can shift your concentration from one task to another um, rather than trying to overlap. And yeah, that's a really big benefit. Yes, yeah, a big yep. benefit of it, I think. Yeah. yeah. Croeso i ffern Malogan Fawr ger Llarwst. Ble mae Llion a Siân Jones wedi bod yn canolbwyntio ar wella cynhyrchiant y ddiadell ar fiches signo fel rhan o waith prosiecta yn sgil i'r ôl fel safle ar ddangos cyswllfermio. Buom mewn digwyddiad agored ar y ffarm yn ddiweddar yn clywed mwy am y gwaith hyn. The fulcrum of your herd fertility is your heifer management. And we can discuss at length, but majority of us hopefully would agree that a tight calving block is the way forward for efficient um, production. Fertility is one of the indices I would, agree, I would suggest that you can use to assess the degree of um, efficiency of production within your herd. So if somebody has a block calving of, say, eight weeks, and another has eight months, then there's a way of describing who, who's more efficient in, or not. Now, getting a block calving of seven, eight weeks isn't that easy. Um, it's easier with the heifer, so that's where we begin. And then the crux of the, of the matter really is which animals can really give you that performance of whatever figure you want to say, say 80% in six weeks, how many of those heifers that you follow up to become first calf heifers can still manage to remain within that tight block? And those, I would suggest, are the animals that we should be breeding because um, fertility has a very strong genetic um, influence and we could be breeding for certain things like we have over the last generations and ignoring fertility at our peril. Because without a shadow of doubt, if you just turn a, a fertile bull to a group of heifers, that is easier than AI. But the AI does give you the added introducing genetics, new genetics, improved genetics into the system. If you want a tight calving block, and if you're using AI and the bull to sweep, or even if you're using the bull only and the number of bulls, whatever, you've got to have fertile bulls. And it's not very difficult to assess the semen evaluation and what is produced in the testes of those bulls. There's more to fertility of bulls than what they produce in the semen, in the testes, I agree. But that's your starting block. One thing we learned from doing the data and collecting data is that you've got to be careful. Um, and one thing we learned was you hear a lot of pelvic measurements now being branded around. Um, and actually, we were surprised the degree of growing that some of these stabilizers were doing in a relatively short period of time 
so that you could call one. They were still tight. There was still, there's a big margin between the widest pelvises and the narrowest pelvises. Um, but even the narrowest were growing when we rechecked them. But the protea doesn't finish there because the proof is in the pudding. It's, we will be then seeing if there's any correlation between the le uh, size of the pelvis um, width and ease of calving. And that will be down to gestation period. Um, because if they pop them out, and because hion has got a very interesting data from last year, the cows and heifers last year were um, about a week, calving a week before the due date. And that's significant. It's a bit of a big ask, calve, uh, bulling them at 14 months and calving them at two years. So we, uh, in the beginning, we didn't look after them good enough, really. Uh, and anything that was empty, they, it was the, well, the, the ones that had been served the second time, really, because they, they had, hadn't put enough condition on. So we try and keep them, um, give them, after, after serving them, after calving the first time, the next winter, they, we look after them. And then we keep um, the heifer separate until, until bulling. Um, after they calved, just uh, we see they got they got bullied quite a bit when we just chucked them in with the cows. Um, so I think that's made a hell of a difference to our conception rates, really. Mae'r mae'r hefyd mae'n llioion ifan iawn ac yn yn canran y chal yn llioion mewn cymnod hyn. Ond yr hyn sydd yn bwysig ydy, pan maen nhw'n dod i mewn i'r bloc nesaf yn loia wedi llioio y llioio cyntaf, y faen sydd yn gallu cynnal y bloc tyn yna a ddim methu cyfebu a troi'n swynogydd. Felly um, mae hwnna yn, yn ffigwr eithaf pwysig ac yn sicrhau bod y prin da ni'n drafod yn gynaladwy. Oedd os oes na nifer o'r hefflod yma yn methu y cyfebu ac yn mynd yn swynogydd, wrth gwrs ydyn nhw'n gynaladwy o, o fath yn y bydd. Ond uh, mae'r ma gwaith yma'n probi bod ni'n bridio uh, i mewn mewn sefyllfa lle da ni'n gallu cael o'n gynaladwy a bod yr hefflod yma yn gallu llwyddo i sefyll eto mewn cymnod hyn. Ac wrth gwrs, mae'r gwaith da ni wedi wneud o ran asesu um, a'i ddfedrwydd i um, tract prydlondeb nhw, pan maen nhw'n hefflod cyn bod nhw'n mynd at cael ei ai, a mesur y pelfis yn rhoi data sydd yn data trend i sicrhau bod ni'n dewis um, hefflod mwyaf ffrwythlon i uh, fod yn llwyddiannus yn y gwaith yma. Mm. Rhan o'r canlyniadau yr gwaith yma oedd bod um, 14 y cant o hefflod gafodd ei ai a misefodd cyfebu mm. wedi cael ei wneud ar sail bod y bwlws wedi ffeindio nhw'n gofyn a nid y ffarmwr. Felly mae'r ffarmwr yn gallu defnyddio a cael chyder yn y dechnoleg newydd yma i helpu effeithiolrwydd o fewn y fichas. A dyna fe, wedi dod i ddiwedd yr haglen yma. Os oedd chi fwy o wybodaeth ar yr hyn rydych wedi gweld heddiw, ewch ar wefan cyswllfermio neu ffoniwch ar rhif canolig cyswllfermio.